I'm really thrilled and excited to have you here, and I'm really honored to have a returning guest with us, and that is the wonderful Jack Butler. Welcome, Jack. Hey. Hi, you all. Thanks for having me back. It's good to be here. So happy to have you back, and I'm really excited about what you have to share today, and I'm really excited about having a great conversation with you. So, Jack, before we jump in, I want to just give everyone a little bit of a formal introduction even though I know many may be familiar with your work. Jack coaches and teaches globally to help women be more of who they really are and wait and trust that they will find the right relationship. He supports deeper levels of freedom, authenticity, and presence beyond the patterns and strategies we take to be our real selves. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about exactly what you mean by that, Jack. Sounds Mm -hmm. intriguing. Yep. Jack has clients from around the world. He has taught on four continents, and his programs have been purchased in over 50 countries. He has a 2.5 million plus view YouTube channel, and I'm sure it's going up by the day, and is the co-creator of the popular relationship ready community. So welcome once again, Jack. So happy yeah. to have you there. Good to be here. Thanks. So we are going to be talking about a topic called, Is He Your Guy? So let's jump in there. Tell us why you chose this topic, and let's uh, let's get started on how we can find out um, or what the signs are that someone might be your guy. Totally. Well, for those who know me either from YouTube or Instagram, there's become this sort of popular refrain that often gets... Uh, kind of joked about a little bit in comments because in a lot of my videos, I have this endpoint that says, if X, Y, Z is happening, he's not your guy. So he's not your guy has become a thing. People often are self-reflecting and then putting in the comments, you know, oh, I noticed this, this, and this, so he's not my guy. So I just think there's a lot of aliveness in this topic. And, you know, my, my hope and desire in this work is that I help people not get overly preoccupied or invested in something that's just never really going anywhere. You know, so Mm -hmm. a lot of what I do is, and it's not a super sexy word, but I call it sobriety is I help people be more sober and to be more clear seeing about who a guy is to them and what he's available for and to be mindful of patterns of unavailability or breadcrumbing or ghosting and kind of wishing it were different rather than even if it's tough, just getting with the reality this isn't really going anywhere and it probably never will. And much better to try and partner with a guy who's ready to partner with and ready to partner with you or at least open to partnering with you than investing a lot of time, energy, money, and also more importantly, heart and emotion in, in something that's just not investable. Mm-hmm. So that's why this topic is important because I know that there's a lot of people that it's relevant to and that there's been resonance with some of my work. So happy. To yeah, for that. sure. For sure. Yeah. And I think this relationship sobriety is very sexy, actually, (laughs) because it's pretty unsexy to be investing your time, energy, love, attention, focus into someone that's not investing back with you. Yes. I think that's actually well said. I totally hear and support that. Yeah. Yeah. So I sometimes call it the fantasy, you know, people being caught up in a fantasy where they're wishing, hoping, believing, Yes. That someone or something is different than what it actually really is. And yeah. I always say that's one of the three F words that can really, um, let's just say, foul up your love life. Uh, yes. <laughs> fantasy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, anytime you find yourself having to distort reality, avoid reality, uh, suppress reality, uh, make excuses for a guy, all of that is really a distraction from what really could be, you know, and, and there's real benefits in this outside of the realm of relationship, the more sober and objective that you can be about what's actually happening in your life, the more you get to be choiceful, the more you don't have to uh, keep, you know, cherished beliefs in place. You you don't have to see the best in people when actually you're avoiding seeing the worst in them as well. It's, it's sort of like a, a whole sort of upgrade that you can do in terms of the way that you are in the world. And it can be so easy for people to be in a narrative, you know, well, he's just so stressed at work, you know, or he needs healing or he's wounded from his ex-girlfriend. All of those things could be true. And if he's not really showing up for a relationship in this season with you, you know, let him find a healer, 
doesn't need to be you, mm-hmm. you know, let him build his business, but he doesn't need to do it on your watch, you know? So it's, uh, yeah, there's a bit more nuance there sometimes, but any time that you're rationalizing, which is a more sophisticated form of defense than some of the other defenses, we haven't to rationalize why it's not available, why it's not working much better to stop, cry, heal, m- grieve, move on than to just keep, uh, kind of plugging the same wound of what, you know, why, why does no guy choose me? It's like, well, actually sometimes you've got to choose yourself first. Absolutely. Absolutely. And ladies, please don't take on the healing projects of other yeah. people's stuff because that is just not a recipe for your happiness and you're going to be most likely in over your head anyway. Yep. Yeah. Amen. A lot of times these men, if we do that, they end up resenting you too. (laughs) Yeah, because in a sense, it's a covert contract, right? You're taking on a role that they haven't actually asked you to take on based upon your perception that they need healing. Or what might be more true is that you find it easier to be over there with someone else than you do to be over here with you, you know, sort of healer, heal thyself. There's probably things in your own healing path that you may not be in contact with, like you find it really hard if... Um, a guy isn't giving you a certain amount of um, attention, you might find it hard just to be with yourself. That's a much better place to start a healing journey than, you know, unconsciously starting healing someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk then. We've talked about some of the things that might be indicative of someone who's not your guy. Yeah. He's not your guy. Let's talk about some of the signs that he might be your guy. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So number one, he wants the job. And I think this one is often overlooked. You know, does he, does he want to be your guy? And does he consider himself that he could be your guy? Uh, if neither of those things are in place and you've been connecting for a while, my imagination is that he's not your guy. You know, I don't think some, he just sort of wakes up one day, you know, eight years in the future and imagines, oh, sorry, yeah, I'm your guy. Of course, sorry, sorry I was breadcrumbing you. Sorry I was ghosting you. Sorry I wasn't showing up for you. So just number one, is, is he wanting that job? And, and yeah. just start there, you know, choose someone that wants to choose you and vice versa, right? This isn't about you being disempowered and a victim. Oh, he chooses you and you don't get to choose. You get to choose as well. But let's at least mutually be in the subset of people where we're kind of choosing each other and not that you're having to persuade me to show up, not that you're having to persuade me that I might want to be your guy. Kind of let, let me choose. Uh, you can do the same, but, but don't avoid that step. Number two, that, and this is slightly impersonal to you, is he at a stage of his life of his masculine development of his path that it makes sense for him to want a partner. So mm-hmm. has he got his, you know, he's another S that people sometimes use here, but has he got his stuff together? You know, it can, has, has he got something going on in his career or his mission? Does he kind of know who he is? Has he got a foundation beneath him? You know, if he's, there might be some exceptions, but if he's still, uh, rebounding from a previous relationship or he hasn't really got any ability to put, you know, food on the table or he doesn't really know where he's going in his career. Um, that's different if you're like already partnered. Sure. We all go through phases, but if he's not yet partnered, I don't think when a guy is trying to figure his stuff out that that's when he's like, Oh great. Let me get, let me get a life partner. Or if he is doing that, sometimes it's an avoidance strategy so that he can put his attention on you and not on the stuff that he needs to take care of and figure out in his own life. So kind of right. importantly to you, is, is, it, is it the time and season that sort of makes sense for him? Um, and then number yeah, three. I think that's a big one. I do. I think uh-huh. it's a really big one. Yeah. I think both of these are really big ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I can remember, it's interesting, you know, when you said the first one, he wants the job. I had a little flashback to a guy I had dated on and off over a decade in my 30s. and. Yeah. Um, I suddenly had, you know, we had, we had stopped seeing each other for a period of time and I had met who is now my husband, my husband, Benjamin. And this old boyfriend, this on and off boyfriend who never really quite wanted the job. Yeah. um, Now was suddenly seeing that he was at risk of losing me. And one thing he said to me is he said, get this. He said, "Um, I always thought you'd be an option for me. That's one thing he said to me. Yep. Which is, he didn't mean it mean, it was just the truth. It just came yeah, out. And totally. um, then I said to him, well, I said, this new man in my life, he wants to be my boyfriend. He wants, he wants the job is what I was saying, right? Yeah. 
Yep. And now this old boyfriend was saying, well, maybe I want the job. Maybe I want the job. But he never wanted the job when he had the opportunity to yeah. have the job. It wasn't Which until is, I was, it was at risk of losing me. So it was yeah. just kind of interesting. That's telling. Yeah. 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 I sometimes put this in like a career context to just give an analogy for people. You know, if you were going to work for a, a top company here, you know, whether you like them or not, let's just say Google, right? And, and you had the opportunity to become a Google senior engineer. You probably wouldn't dabble. You wouldn't really expect to be like, oh yeah, I'll come in Monday, but you know, maybe you won't see me for the rest of the week. And then next week I'll, I'll think about whether I want to see you. Or It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's a bit zero one, you know, if you want the job, great. But if you don't, we'll just go find another engineer. There's plenty of people that would like this opportunity. And I, I think it's a sort of similar thing. And why this gets confusing is because when people do or guys do, what your your ex-boyfriend, what you're talking about there, is that no one really likes losing connection, right? Even a guy who has zero intention of ever making you his, you know, committed partner or wife or anything like that, he doesn't want you out of his life, right? Why would he? If he likes you and has a connection with you, most guys, and I'm not making them wrong for this, just like you're saying, yeah, they want that option, you know, and when you, you withdraw your love, energy and attention, they notice it and they typically don't like it. And you just have to distinguish a guy missing the connection is very different than him wanting the job. Yes. Right? That's the, yep. the piece because they say, oh, well, he's got back in touch. Now he's texting me. Now he misses me. And I think that really confuses the sort of the feminine and the female psychology in some ways. And it's like, yeah, I get it. It can be confusing and just kind of get it downloaded a little bit now when you're maybe not in that situation, missing someone. Of course, that's part of life. Anyone's going to miss a connection it has nothing to do with their compatibility with you or their ability to be your partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm really glad you brought this up. I think it's really, really important. So anything else you want to say as far as other signs that he might be your guy? Yeah, I think the third thing is is consistency of showing up, right? And so we can think of consistency in different ways. We can think of you guys having a meaningful connection, you know, two or three or more times a week. We can think of consistency that the trajectory of the relationship kind of stabilizes into some sort of consistent contact and togetherness. Um, relationships can vary a lot as to what that right balance is between two people. But if the mm -hmm. relationship was doing this, and then at some point he became what I call drop off guy. That's not a good indication that this relationship's going somewhere. The mm -hmm. other caveat I'll just throw in there is, you know, sometimes people talk about, but he's been so consistent and I'm like digging into it. And I find out what they really mean is he's been consistently texting them since they met on a dating app, but they haven't actually been together in person and he hasn't yet been able to figure mm -hmm. out how to take them on a date. And they're in this kind of pseudo relationship where they're now texting each other, good morning, good night. They're giving each other compliments, but they don't really know who each other is because they've never actually spent quality time together. So just a little caveat, when I'm talking about consistency, I'm talking, you know, three, six, nine, 12 months plus. I'm talking in words as well as in actions. I'm talking about a sense that this person is showing up in your life, that they you know, support you in certain ways that they're in multiple domains of your life and, and vice versa. I'm talking about a sort of full blooded consistency and not, you know, can I be a consistent pen pal, but I've never taken you on a date. Right. Um, those guys can be confusing to people because there's, there's particularly if you're more prone on the anxious side of attachment, there can be this getting into relationship prematurely and this like, I'm sort of in a relationship, but you're not really in a relationship. You're, you're just in a pen pal connection that's quite intense. And so let's distinguish those things so that when you say consistency, we mean significant months and we mean week in, week out, day in, day out. Yeah. It's not just a cyber relationship. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Because yeah. most of us can enjoy those things because, you know, I, I, we talk about sobriety, the reality for a lot of us that being in relationship, particularly if relationship is our area of pain, growth and transformation, right? Which for a lot of people watching right now, that it will be the case. It certainly is the case for me in my life. So if that's true, uh, relationships already are going to have its challenges and difficulties and particularly with, you know, the levels of autonomy that people have now and the options that people have now and all that good stuff and figuring out money and power and resources and shared space and kids. If you go down that route, there's a lot of things to figure out, let alone, wow, we've never even managed to get in person together. You know, if a guy right. can't figure out how to date you, he's not going to figure out how to be your partner. You know, that's right. Also comes up in long distance relationships where people are like, wow, we've been together, you know, six, 12, 18 months, but we've never met. 
and he can't actually figure out how to take you on a date, you know? And I realize, you know, long distance relationships cost more money. You've got to figure out planes and visas and stuff. But if a guy can't figure that out, you're not in a relationship with him. So, you know, that's a little hard to hear for some people, but I'd rather you heard it and had the painful realization than again, investing weeks, months, years of your life in something that's not a relationship really by any stretch. Yeah. It comes back to that sobriety yep. that we talked about. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've touched a little bit on some of this already, but but let's talk about this this phenomenon that is so commonly talked about these days as far as breadcrumbing and yes. like a little bit about what it is if people are not as familiar and what to do with it, how to overcome it. Yeah. Okay, so just definitionally, I mean, there's no, you know, kind of one unified definition of breadcrumbing. I, I just point to sporadic contact so contact yeah. that is inconsistent and you know whether that's you know text communication or actually getting together in person more the sense that he hits you up when he wants some connection or he misses you or sometimes he wants sexual contact and it's kind of like yeah it's more like a booty call or it's uh i only hit you up when i'm in your part of the world but otherwise we don't really have that much um, connection. So it's, it's sort of, you know, we, we contrast breadcrumbs with the full loaf, right? So the full loaf of relationship is real, full blooded, consistent contact, guy showing up, words and actions matching. Doesn't have to be perfect, right? No guy will ever 100% always match all his actions with all his words, but 90%, 95% plus, there's an integrity, there's a care, and there's a desire to be in connection with you consistently. Breadcrumbing is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. It's, it's erratic, inconsistent, sporadic. You don't really know whether you're going to hear from him. You don't hear from him for a month and suddenly he hits you up a lot. And if you just look in, you know, sort of animal, uh, like behavioral studies, you know, if you, if you inconsistently feed rats, they keep coming back again and again and again and again because they never know. And it, it can be very arresting to our nervous systems to have this sort of contact because it's like, well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe at some point he's going to not be hot and cold. Maybe he's going to run warm and hot. And there's a part of you that always wonders, that imagines, um, and then occasionally just pops up out of the blue. So this kind of inconsistent contact is difficult because it's arresting to the nervous system. And so it can be addictive and intoxicating. Um, yeah, and, and, I, and I think sometimes it's like almost like it feels like the man has some kind of sixth sense where he just knows exactly how much attention or when to actually reach out just uh, enough to kind of keep you going. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that might be true. I mean, there's, there might be a version of this, which is, you know, maybe more like part of a narcissistic approach from a guy. There also could just be that you know, you're not that much to this guy. You're just kind of, you know, an interesting connection or an interesting option or someone that he's, you know, he's attracted to, but never has a desire for, for more than that. And so he kind of hits you up when he's lonely or when he's feeling disconnected or when he's happens to be in your part of the world. Again, I don't need to make that wrong. I, I'm really not majoring in making a guy wrong for something that, you know, you don't have an agreement with him. You don't have, you know, there's no agreement that he doesn't have to show up like that. I'm much more in the game of, women being sober and just saying, well, do you want to play ball with that? And if you don't stop it and stop mm -hmm. being a victim, don't blame him. Just choose what you want and redirect your attention because people can become, uh, you know, PhDs in breadcrumbing, but that doesn't really teach you how to have a real relationship. I'd much rather that you got your PhD and focusing on what it is that you actually want and focusing on a guy that is available, has some consistency and wants to show up for you. Mm hmm. Yeah, I like that perspective. And I like the perspective that it it might not be that he really has any sort of sinister motive. It's just, you know, it's just that's who you are to him. You're an interesting connection or an option. Yep. And it might be because you're wanting it to be more than that. Yes. That you're attached to those contacts. You know, every contact you might make me more than it actually does in your mind. Yep. And so then you're a willing participant in what feels like a game. Yes, totally. I've noticed the language there. I, I like the language you're using. You're, you're using the language of willing participant rather mm -hmm. than the language of victimhood. And I think if you can make that shift into, okay, yeah, I am co-creating this in some ways. I am participating in this and I get to have my no and my voice. Then you take the power back. Then you're no longer you know, victim to some breadcrumber or recreating a pattern from your past. You know, Maybe you're 
you know, first boyfriend or your ex was unavailable, or maybe your mom or your dad was unavailable, or, you know, it's so easy to recreate these things and still think that the problem's externally. By that shift into willing participant, you, you internalize and say, hey, where are my levers of control? How am I showing up and how can I choose differently? And that, that makes all the difference. You know, said, said simply, there are so many, quote, relationship games that you can play with people. And you just have to choose, do I want to play that kind of game? And if I don't, even if it's really, really hard, I want to say stop. You know, and stop might mean, yeah, I get a support of a coach or a therapist. Or every time I think about reaching out to him, I reach out to someone else as a substitute behavior because I know that of those moments of vulnerability, I'm going to be liable. If he hits me up on that night where I'm vulnerable, I'm probably going to say yes. I'm probably going to see him and then I'm going to regret it the next day. What about if in advance you think about it and actually have a plan to do something different so that in the moment you don't have to make that decision and it already got made for you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I like it. And I think one of the symptoms of breadcrumbing is you're always feeling a little bit starving. You're always Mm. like wanting or hoping for a little bit more or hoping that it's going to turn into a little bit more. And that can come back into the kind of self-deception where we believe or go into a fantasy of believing that it is going to turn into more or we, or we, make more of an individual contact or something that he says than it actually yes. means. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really common. The, the, the way out of that is to have as few assumptions as possible so that you're not actually making meaning that, that may not exist and that you, where possible, you get shared reality with a guy, you know? So if you're making the meaning that, you know, because he accidentally, um, left his underwear at your house or left a bag of his stuff or left his favorite cereal or bought you flowers. If you're making that mean something, again, this might sound a little unsexy, but in service of sobriety, you might just check that out with him and say, Hey, I've got this story that because you left your bag of stuff at my house that you're really into this relationship. Is that right? Um, because otherwise you're going to be off in this fantasy world And at some point, what happens when you're in fantasy world is reality crashes hard. The rug gets pulled. And it actually wasn't him necessarily pulling the rug from under you. It was the rug was being pulled under your own self-deception and illusion that you'd created in a story and a fantasy. Story and fantasy can be so powerful. But it's better to know consciously that you're doing that than unconsciously. And at some point, you're going to rub up against what is actually happening. And that can be devastating because you're, you're basically, you're building, 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 thinking it's going somewhere, you know? So anytime you've got a sort of story about what it means and it's not backed up by not just one, I would say several conversations with him where you actually have shared reality and it's matched by some consistency from his actions, unless all that's in place, you don't actually know where you stand. So don't try and have a story about it if at all possible. You can have hopes, but don't imagine that your hope is reality. You know, it's just a hope. It's just an idea. Don't be attached to it. Yeah. Yeah. So powerful and empowering because mm-hmm. it takes us out of that victimhood role that you talked about. And I think that's really important. So I think you touched on this a little bit already, but as far as if you, if you recognize you're in one of these situations and you decide you don't want this anymore, yeah. you don't want to play this game anymore, yep. whether you're a willing participant or believe that or not, you don't want to do it anymore. Yep. How, how does a woman like kind of reclaim that power, go no contact, move in a different direction? Yeah. We touched on some of this, but I think mm-hmm. it's worth like revisiting this just a little bit because we really want to empower people. Yeah. Well, so let's just take something that you've said there and, and going to get some shared reality about it. So you, you, you talked about going no contact. So going no contact is powerful because it allows you to redirect your attention on yourself and it stops you kind of getting activated by contact from him. Um, so one important thing can be about going no contact is that you do it fully, right? There's a, it's, it's not the, the prettiest expression, but you might've heard this expression, you know, um, 99% a bitch, a hundred percent a breeze. And it basically means if you try and do something 99%, it's much harder than if you actually say, look, I'm just not going to eat chocolate. Not I'm going to eat chocolate. Occasionally, just not eat chocolate. So go no contact means 100% no contact, which doesn't mean that you're liking his posts on social media. Doesn't mean that, oh, he called me, so I picked up. Doesn't mean, though, he texted me that, you know, he misses me, and so I had to text back. It actually means zero. And if you get to the end of a no contact period and you're sort of like, you know, a dog that's excited that you can't wait to be back in the contact, you need to roll that on. 
you know, you need to probably have another 30 days or whatever period of no contact you're doing because we want to get to the point where he's no longer arresting to you in your nervous system. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one thing is just how to go no contact well. Also, I would probably make the declaration to him so he knows and make the request, hey, uh, this isn't going anywhere that I want it to go. Thanks for you know, the contact we've had. I don't want to have more contact with you and I request that you don't contact me. Because at least then he kind of knows what's going on. Now he may fight you or he may still want to hit you up if he's, you know, fine, but you don't then have to respond. And we have shared reality about what it is um, that you're actually doing. I think the other thing that hugely supports this is actually just getting it right up here. When you realize breadcrumb will never, ever, ever become the full loaf and that the right guy for you will never breadcrumb you. If you just really get that, it becomes much more simple because then you're not trying to make something of it. You're not trying to distort, delude, fantasize, shift narrative. It's like, no, if, if a guy's into you, you kind of know that he's into you. He doesn't tend to have sporadic contact. That's not really yeah. how it works. If he wants to have the job, you know, if he wants to just be a lover, maybe. If he wants to be your occasional boyfriend when he's in you know, your part of the world, fine. But if he actually wants the job of being your person, showing up for you, holding space for you, um, dealing with life with you, then he's never going to be a breadcrumber. And so I think for a lot of people, just getting that in their system, like, oh, breadcrumber is never the guy period. I don't know really any exceptions to that. Um, that's a much more powerful stance to be. Now, if he two years down the line comes back into your life and he's in a very different position, he's got his stuff together, he's ready for a relationship and he wants to have that with you, you can reopen the door then. But in the meantime, live your life. Don't be hanging on for any possibility. Close it out. And the vast majority of times that I've seen, these people don't come back. So... Mm -hmm. clarity is power in that sense yeah and i love the simplicity of just knowing your guy is never going to be the breadcrumbing guy right i love that simplicity because it just you know think of the hours of analysis paralysis you've just saved women out there by saying it that (laughs) clearly (laughs) yeah absolutely and i like that you've said that because it is so easy to get stuck in analysis and also over personalization, you know, have I done something wrong? Did I say something? Was it something I said on the last day? Go around endlessly. And all of that is a bit of a distraction. You don't even need to understand why a guy is breadcrumbing you. All you need to do is be able to identify that that's what's happening. You know, mm-hmm. I don't need to understand French. I just need to know you're speaking a language that I don't speak. I don't, cool. That's what it is. It's a language I don't understand. I don't need to understand it and analyze it. There's a similar thing with breadcrumbing. It's just like, yeah, it's not what I want period. And, you know, let, let, a, let his therapist explain it. Why do you need to explain it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And so um, that simplifies things so much. And I think that's so powerful because I do think one of the tendencies that women often have, I'm speaking as one who's done it myself mm-hmm. so many times, is we do get caught up in this analysis paralysis yes. where we're analyzing every little word and every yes. little thing that he said and every yes. little yes. interaction to, yes. to death, yes. driving ourselves nuts. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I love the simplistic, I love the simplicity of just saying, no, the right guy is never going to be the bread crumbing guy. Yeah. And we don't have to know why, and we don't have to analyze why, and we don't have to be their therapist or their healer. In fact, please don't. Yep. Please don't. Please don't. Okay, so this is really great. Um, Do you have anything else you want to say on this topic before we kind of begin to wrap up? Any last, like, kind of words of advice or wisdom for the women out there that may have experienced some of this or anything like that? encouragement just giving you a chance to kind of yeah you know you might have to feel some things that you don't want to feel right so if you've had this idea that this person's going to be something or could be something and then you sort of get with the reality and the sobriety that hey they're not you know you may feel really disappointed you know you may feel rejected you may feel sad you may feel angry you know my encouragement is to try and feel those things as authentically and directly as possible without attaching another story or narrative to them, right? So feeling sad doesn't mean, woe betide me, when will I ever get in a relationship? It never happens for me. I'm the unfortunate one. You know, all my friends have relationships. Why not me? Let's turn down the volume on all that stuff and just try and be as directly as possible with, 
the disappointment and actually feel it. Because if you feel it fully, you can probably move through it in you know, minutes, hours, days. But if you don't and you stay stuck in the intellectual and the analysis and the story that somehow you're the unfortunate one and life never shows up for you and you're never supported, you're probably going to be stuck in it for weeks and months and sometimes even more. You know, I know people that breadcrumbed and, you know, a year later, they're still talking about it or someone has been a pen pal with them for 15 years and they're still talking as if this person one day will get with them. And it's like, I don't think it works like that, you know? So short-term pain for long-term freedom. And the other opportunity is that some people, and, you know, I think I was like this historically, find it hard to just be on, be on your own right? And so we're always looking for relationship. We're always looking for that kind of missing piece. There's a missing piece often that's also located inside us, which is called, you know, am I really present to myself? Am I really in relationship with myself? Do I have intimacy with myself? Can I stay with my experience? We're also fixated on being abandoned by people sometimes. And I get it, you know, there's good kind of attachment and childhood reasons for that. But it's so easy to abandon yourself, right? Anytime you get in a fantasy about a guy breadcrumbing you, then it's not going anywhere. You kind of abandon yourself. You lose yeah. your power. You lose your center. If you know deep down that you'll never abandon yourself, even in your darkest hour, you will always be by your side, present, doing the best you can, championing yourself, being just like a good you know, parent or partner. If you can do that to yourself, then there are so many other things that you don't need to get fixated on. Because you're like, you know, I'm already coming from a place of feeling a little bit more whole, real, and intact. So this guy isn't solving a problem in my life. He's not solving a deficit need. It's actually that, wow, I want to be in relationship because I want more intimacy, more connection. We can do things together. But if you find that you've never had a period of life where you've been single and you've been happy with it, that's your invitation to do some deeper inner work usually. Because if you've never been happy in singleness, relationship isn't going to solve the problems that you think it's going to solve. It will just cover them up or you will outsource your power to someone else. Um, or, you're, or one day once the romantic infatuation burns off, you'll still be left with yourself. You know, there's no, no free pass to not being able to be with and deal with ourselves in my experience. And that work can start now. And it's deep and it's profound and it's meaningful. And it really, you know, if people really want to know about self-love, you can't really love yourself fully if you're not present to yourself. Because otherwise you're somewhere else. You're at your lunch. You know? Can you really love a child if you're never present to them? Not really. Same with you. So it's an opportunity. All of this pain, and I get it, it can be so painful and so excruciating, but it's an opportunity that's calling you to something deeper and more real and more free in yourself. And when you get that, even if it's painful, and wow, I've had some personal struggles in this myself, but even if it's really painful, it's worth it because you end up in a, you know, in a much more free, real, and loving place than you ever were if you were trying to get love from someone and heal them or like need them to show up for a certain way just to solve a problem that you've got to solve yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think even if, if there's a pattern of unhealthy relationships, a, a pattern that you've had in your life, it is a real opportunity to explore and even ask some of those questions you know, where am I not showing up fully for myself or how am I not yeah. showing up fully for myself? Because if there's a pattern of that, chances are this is, is not just in the relationship area of your life. Right. Yeah. Chances are yeah. this is going on in other areas of your life as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I've really loved our conversation today, Jack. I think this has been really, really great Yay. and really important. Thanks. I've enjoyed it. Thanks for having yeah. me on. And um, we Thank want you. to, Jack and I want to acknowledge all of you for being here because the fact that you're here and that you're investing your time and energy into listening to these conversations and going deeper with this work means you're the kind of person that is committed to having an extraordinary life and extraordinary love. And so we honor you for that. Mm -hmm. And well we hope to see you for more. Bye for now. Take care, guys. Thanks for having me.